Welcome back to the Captography tutorial. This is going to be part two. And uh, in part one, we covered a lot of the research behind Captography use. Um, in this part, we're going to discuss a little bit more uh, why we use it. Um, we've already discussed this, this component. You know, circulation, uh, ventilation, and metabolism. The three things that are required to get a Capnography value and the three things that Capnography can actually tell you about. Um, so... Uh, you remember, you need to be circulating blood to move that CO2 to the lungs. Um, in the lungs, you need to uh, move the CO2 out to get your capnography value, okay? And, and, and you'll in turn move oxygen in, which then needs to be metabolized at the cellular level to produce CO2 to circulate back to the lungs again. So I think we kind of drove home that point in part one. Um, I want to make a... a an interesting point here the difference between oxygenation and ventilation this often gets confused sometimes people have a problem with oxygenation and they don't so much have a problem with ventilation but sometimes they have a problem a ventilatory problem uh, which ends up being an ox oxygenation problem let's kind of just talk about the two real quick oxygenation you measure with a pulse oximeter uh, in the field, in the pre-hospital arena, we measure oxygenation with a pulse oximeter. And even on into the hospital, they continually monitor oxygenation with this pulse ox device. And ventilation, we can actually measure with capnography. Remember, if you ventilate, you're moving CO2 out. And that's how we measure the ventilation through capnography. Um, we're also measuring... Uh, to a, to a degree, cardiac output and cellular metabolism, because those two things also must be in play. But what does it mean to, me to measure oxygenation? Um, well, really, that pulse ox device is just telling you, it's only telling you that the hemoglobin at that level, at that finger that you're measuring, or wherever you are, is saturated uh, with oxygenation, or with oxygen, sorry. It could be saturated with something else like carbon monoxide and still give you a uh, pulse ox reading. But, you know, for 99% of your patients, it's just telling you that the, at that level, uh, you're having oxygen-saturated hemoglobin. It's not telling you that they're moving air in and out of their lungs, like a capnography device will. One thing that you can try uh, to, to kind of show the difference between the two, put a pulse oximeter on your finger. And at the same time, put on a capnography device. Like let, they, they make a nasal cannula-like device, nasal prongs, that, that will take your capnography value. Now hold your breath. And you will notice on your capnogram, it will immediately flatline. It's like the equivalent on an EKG to a systole. You will immediately flatline where your pulse oximetry values will stay within a normal range for a prolonged period of time. So what does this tell you? Which one's better? I mean, if you're, me me or if you're uh, monitoring a patient, you're certainly going to use pulse ox. I mean, we always do because we need to know if we need to provide supplemental oxygen. But is that going to tell you if the patient stops breathing? No, it won't. Uh, you need to have capnography on that patient. And it's, it's imperative on certain patients. For, for instance, the patient with respiratory compromise, you should have capnography on. The patient who you're administering narcotics to. Remember, narcotics are respiratory depressants. Why not have that patient on capnography to see if you're causing a ventilatory cap compromise? Any patient with hemodynamic compromises, you know, your shocky patients, you should have on capnography because it tells you a world of information that you will not get from blood pressure or from pulse oximetry or from an EKG. It's just another assessment tool and you have to look at it as that. You can't look at it as a, just a, uh, a tool to confirm innovation, as we spoke about earlier. While capnography directly measures ventilation in the lungs, it also indirectly tells you a lot about cardiac output and cellular metabolism, but an increase in cardiac output will give you increased capnography values. For instance, that return to spontaneous circulation patient. If you had that patient that was in cardiac arrest and you suddenly got a pulse back, you will get a spike in your capnography values and it tells you that, that you had an increase in cardiac output. Similarly, uh, a decrease in cardiac output will give you a decrease in entitled CO2 values. And now you have to kind of weigh and measure, well, is this value due to ventilation or uh, cardiac output? Well, if they're breathing normally and you have a sudden decline in capnography, you need to start checking a blood pressure, check your patient's heart rate, uh, check for a pulse, 
look at their skin color condition and temperature, and you use everything combined to kind of get an idea of whether or not uh, you're having a, a, a cardiac output compromise. This should say CO2, uh, I haven't changed it, but this should say CO2 is the smoke from the flames of, of, of metabolism. Because CO2 is kind of the exhaust from the exhaust pipe. It's the product of combustion at the cellular, cellular level. Uh, if your heart was your motor and you know, you're uh, using up gasoline, well, that would be oxygen, and producing exhaust, that would be your CO2. Kind of look, look at it like that. PACO2, or partial pressure of carbon dioxide in arterial blood gas, that's a common uh, ABG that they measure in the hospital. And if you're into critical care medicine, you're very uh, familiar with this, and this le whole lecture might seem a little bit elementary to you, but uh, the ABG values, not super important uh, as far as most pre-hospital medicine's concerned, but as you get into the emergency room, they become more important. And we... we have a myriad of research based on PaCO2 because it's been around for a while. We've been measuring it for a while. And there's a lot of correlation between the two, between your, your PaCO2 and your entitled CO2 in the stable patient. So if your patient doesn't have any ventilatory compromise or perfusion problems, their entitled CO2 value and their partial pressure of carbon dioxide in their arterial blood gas will be similar. Not super important for EMS uh, folks, but it, as you get in the hospital, it, it kind of helps to get an idea of what their entitled CO2 value was pre-hospitally, and you'll, you can kind of guesstimate where it's going to be as far as their PaCO2 value goes. Um, but this becomes an issue if you have any type of ventilation perfusion mismatch. It's called a VQ mismatch, and this can occur in all types of patients, pulmonary embolism being a common one, or, uh, but this VQ mismatch will definitely alter the correlation between the PaCO2 and the entitled CO2. Remember, PETCO2 is the same as saying uh, entitled CO2. It's just a, another type of abbreviation. Um, and this VQ mismatch can be caused by blood shunting uh, and, and other different pathologies. Uh, it's, it's actually talked about a lot in the literature. Again, if you're into critical care medicine, you're very familiar with this VQ mismatch uh, process. The normal entitled CO2 value is between 35 and 45. Now, depending on what literature or what book or what publication you're reading, it might have a different range. Some say 30 to 40. Some say 35 to 40. Um, but this is generally, 35 to 45 is generally accepted as the normal range. And you can have an alteration in this based on the anatomy of the patient or any obstruction in the device. Uh, so try to get good airflow into whatever type of device you're using. Remember, it's going to be very dependent on the person using it, just like everything else we do. So looking at this, uh, I've kind of dissected the parts of the normal capnogram or, or capnograph by putting these letters on. It doesn't normally have these letters, obviously. A is where you start breathing out, okay? And then A to B, that's your exhalation upstroke. So remember, this is breathing out, not breathing in, breathing out. So whenever you breathe out or exhale, you're starting to send CO2 out of your body. And the more CO2 you send out, the higher this plateau is going to be. Okay? And remember, uh, B to C is exhalation. That's your exhalation plateau. Okay? C is the entitled CO2 value. That's the actual entitled CO2 value where we get the uh, peak concentration of CO2. And then when you start to breathe in, you wash all that CO2 out of the lungs, and that's where you have this C to D line. And then from D to A, you have some post-inspiration, uh, dead space exhalation uh, taking place. This is, this is the moment when you're not breathing, uh, really, in between breaths from D to A. Okay? And then you breathe in, and you breathe out. Notice exhalation takes longer than, uh, I'm sorry, and then you breathe out, and then you breathe in. And... Exhalation takes longer than inhalation, and that's kind of important to remember when you're uh, actively manually, manually ventilating a patient uh, with a BVM or whatever you're using uh, to, to just allow for that two-second exhalation because uh, you don't want to start stacking breaths. And if you're ever ventilating a patient, use capnography. It's a great tool, and it, it will give you kind of a qualitative measurement of how good you're ventilating them. 
In tidal CO2 uh, values less than 35 are considered hypocapnic. That's when you're low in tidal CO2 values. And for this discussion, I want you to look at carbon dioxide, CO2, as an acid. Okay. Now, if you look at your buffer system and you know your, your chemi chemical equation, uh, CO2 actually does turn into hydrogen and is an acid, so to speak. So if you look at CO2 as an acid in the body, it's going to make a lot more sense. So when you have less CO2, when you're hypocapnic, okay, you're going to be alkalotic. You're going to have respiratory alkalosis. Remember, in tidal CO2 is either going to be respiratory alkalosis or respiratory acidosis. It doesn't tell you about metabolic acidosis or alkalosis, just the respiratory comp component of your uh, pH system. So looking at this again, uh, if you have an in tidal of less than 35, you, you're hypocapnic and you have respiratory alkalosis, in tidal CO2 greater than 45, because remember normal would be between 35 and 45, would be hypercapnia, greater than 45, hypercapnia, too much uh, CO2, and that would be respiratory acidosis, respiratory acidosis. It's going to be important um, as we talk about the different uh, things that change the values, but that's the end of part two. It was uh, kind of a short discussion. Uh, in part three, we're going to get even more into capnography uh, and, and show you the different pathologies that cause the, the different values outside of the normal ranges.